The three-phase motor is by far the most widely used in industrial applications, especially where you need good consistent speed even under varying loads. The induction motor is very rugged. It's only got a few parts as I'm going to show you here in a moment. And it's actually simpler than the single phase induction motor and that's why I want to show you this one first. Let's begin by breaking this guy open and then we'll talk about the components that are there. Now that we have it apart, let's take a look at the anatomy here. And beside it, I have a single phase induction motor just for comparison. With the three phase motor, you can see we have uh, this part, which is essentially the rotor. It's got these aluminum rings on the end. Sometimes it's made out of copper. Copper is a better conductor, but aluminum is a little bit cheaper. So uh, sometimes they're made out of aluminum like this. Now, if you look right along the edge, you can see these little uh, raised areas around the ring. Those are actually aluminum bars that go all the way down to this other side. And what you end up with there is a little circuit. Uh, they're connected at both ends and the aluminum bar is essentially the same as a wire. It can conduct electricity to the other side. But the thing I want you to notice about these rotors, and here's another one. As you can see the single phase motor is made the same way. What was interesting about this though is that there is no electrical connection between the rotor and the three phase motor or the single phase motor. If you don't have a commutator, you don't have any way of uh, putting electricity directly on the rotor, well, what in the world makes this spin? Uh, that's a concept we're going to come back to here in just a moment. Here we have the stator, which is a concept you should be familiar with now. And as you can see, Similar to what I've shown you before, uh, a large number of windings. The last part I want to point out here is these caps on the end. As you can see, these serve as places for the electrical connections. Uh, but again, there's no connection to where the rotor sits. That's just where the bearing uh, is supported by the end belt. And it also happens to be a convenient place to plug your wires in to the stator, but no electrical connection to the rotor. And then the other end bell, in this case, is attached to the rotor. I could take that off, but I want to be able to put this one back together, so I'm going to leave it on there. But that's it. You've got your stator housing uh, with the stator fill, the two end bells. The bottom one usually serves to support the bearing as well as give you a place to mount all your electronics. And then you've got the rotor itself, which doesn't connect electrically to anything in the motor. Now let's have a look at how induction works. All right, let me explain the details of my model here and then we'll demonstrate this principle for you. So here you see I just have a simple disc that's got two bearings on it and that's just to allow it to spin. On the other side of the plexiglass, which is only here just to show you that there's no connection, they're not touching each other, I've got an aluminum disc, which is a, a very good conductor. And as we saw earlier, uh, many motors are made out of aluminum. All right, let's spin this guy up and see what happens. Now, as you can see, the aluminum disc is spinning. And it's spinning just a little bit slower than the magnetic field that's spinning behind it. If you've been paying attention and following this, you ought to know why this is occurring. But I'm gonna let it soak in for just a second. All right, so the concept you're observing here is induction. This is what makes the induction motor different from uh, say the DC motor that we saw where electricity was directly conducted to the rotor through the commutator. In this case, there is no electrical connection between our rotor and our spinning magnetic field. And when the magnetic field spins, the aluminum disc becomes an electromagnet. Current begins to flow because all of the conditions for electromagnetism have been met. We've got a relative motion between the magnetic field and the conductor. And those are your three requirements. Once you have that relative motion, your magnetic field and your conductor, electricity or current will begin to flow in the conductor. It has a north and a south pole now, just like any other magnet. 
But once it has a north and a south pole, it wants to follow the north and the south pole of the uh, spinning magnetic field. It's just like a compass. In fact, if I hold the compass here and spin it, you can see the very same action. The compass spins to align itself with the magnetic field the same way uh, the compass will align itself with the magnetic field of the Earth. I'm going to bring you in just a little bit closer and let you see that one more time. And the closer I hold it, the better the induction is and the better it spins. And that's basically what induction is. Of course, if you had to spin the magnets manually, that would be a terrible motor. So we want to create our magnetic field with electromagnets that we can move electrically. Well, I showed you in the very first episode that when you run current through a wire, it produces a north and a south pole. And that's dependent upon the direction of current flow. If you switch the current flow to the opposite side, then the polarity of the magnet will also switch. Instead of having a north and a south pole oriented like this, now this is your north pole and this is your south pole. Taking that one step further, if we run alternating current through this wire, you're gonna have an oscillating north and south pole, north-south and then south, uh, then north-south and so on. It'll continue to switch back and forth. Okay, let's make a diagram. Here we have our rotor and we're going to draw in our coils and for the sake of simplicity we're going to make this a six pole motor. Now generally the way the motor is wound is part of the coil will be on top and there'll be one wire going to the bottom and then the rest of the coil will continue in the same direction. So if it's coiled clockwise on the top the bottom will be coiled the same way. Uh, when this is energized, okay, just looking at one coil for now with AC current there's our AC sine wave, and we know that uh, we're going to call this positive up here and negative, and here uh, the current flow is zero. The duration of that cycle is going to vary depending upon where you live, but it's usually 50 to 60 hertz. 60 hertz would be one full cycle 60 times per second. Uh, hertz is cycles per second. Okay, now with that in mind, remember when the voltage is positive, your polarity is going to be one way, and then when it goes negative, it's the other way. So we're going to say for now, uh, initially this one is energized north here and south. And I said this is a six pole motor, so let's draw in a couple more. We've got our six poles. If we wire all these up to single phase power, uh, when the current flows through it, uh, three of these will be north and three of these will be south and they'll continue to flip back and forth if that makes sense. So let's just say we have uh, a north like this and then south, south. And then half a cycle later these will all flip and all of these will be south and all of these will be north. And that happens very rapidly, right? 60 times per second. That gives you an oscillating magnetic field, but it doesn't actually rotate the rotor. Uh, what happens when you wire a motor like this, even single phase motors, which are designed to operate with single phase power, they just hum. They don't actually rotate. Uh, you need something additional to get it to rotate. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. The way the three phase motor solves this problem is it uses three AC supplies shifted out of phase with each other so that they all don't have the same polarity at the same time. Okay, and I'll just put uh, a picture on the screen to help this time. Let's draw another motor. If you've got three different supplies of AC current and they're 120 degrees out of phase with each other, that's 120 electrical degrees. If you think of one full cycle as 360 degrees, then if you shifted these each 120 degrees, the three phases, they'll be evenly spaced over the full cycle. Okay, so looking at my diagram on the screen, when we initially energize this guy, you can look at where the phases are, and one will be like this, and one is just starting to become north, this one's uh, just starting to get south, and this one is getting ready to flip. 
right now it's uh, just barely north over here and south over here and it's getting ready to flip to the other side okay so just uh, one third of a cycle later this guy is fully north this guy is just starting to flip this one's south and this one is now uh, starting to flip now if you notice a pattern going on here as this cycle keeps going what you'll have is a, a north and then a north and then a north and then a north and then a north and you see what you end up with is a spinning magnetic field and therefore any rotor that's immersed in this rotating a magnetic field will have will take its own poles and try to align it with the magnetic field that's rotating there's just one problem with this three-phase induction motor and that is three-phase power is usually only found at industrial sites uh, most residents don't have three-phase power we have single-phase power if you take single-phase power and hook it up to this three-phase motor uh, you won't get anything it's not designed to function on that well that's where single phase motors come in like this but just like I told you earlier the single phase motor if you supply a three phase motor or a single phase motor with just straight single phase line it doesn't spin it just hums current is still being induced in the rotor but it's not actually producing a torque because the magnetic field doesn't spin it's just oscillating top and bottom well uh, we've obviously found a way around that and that is going to be a topic in the very next episode so when you come back we're going to talk about the single phase induction motor i'm going to break out my trainer here we'll uh, inject this rotor in and you'll actually uh, see this guy get fired up and I'll teach you how the motor gets started. I forgot to mention this in the last episode, but if I've made any technical errors, uh, whenever I do a teaching video like this, it's always possible that I've omitted something important, edited it out, forgot to say something, or was just wrong. And if that happens, I will add notes to, to the description, so please be sure to have a look at that. If you have any questions about motors, please go ahead and scroll down and leave them in the comment section. Uh, at the end of this series, I'm going to make a video where I just go through your questions and answer all your questions about motors. So be sure to uh, let me know what your questions are. I'm going to put a couple videos on the screen for you. The one on this side is going to be uh, a link to the playlist so that you can watch this whole series in order. If you are not a subscriber, uh, you can join my neighborhood by clicking on the subscribe button right here. And uh, I'll welcome you into the family. All right. I'll see you guys soon.